All right, so what will we need to make this? First off, I've got my inspiration scrunchie. I want this to be a lot of fabric because I have a lot of hair. So I'm gonna make it wider and chunky like this one. We also have a safety pin, two different kinds of elastic. You'll only need to choose one. I've got a hair tie that's a little stretched out. And then also just some elastic left over from another project. This is a little more decorative than you would normally need to use because no one's gonna actually see this, but it's what I had on hand. I've also got a hand needle and some thread. So for time's sake, I'm going to use my machine for sewing for this video, but use what you have. And if that's a needle and thread, go for it. Also, I have my trusty straight edge and measuring quilting square. And then also, these are some spring-loaded fabric shears. If you see yourself sewing a lot and you're gonna be cutting a lot of fabric or doing other crafty projects, it's nice to have spring-loaded shears because they help save your hands. And they last a really long time. If you buy one pair of shears, they'll last you for years and you can get them sharpened when they're dull. And lastly, I have fabric. Let's talk about that now. So here I have two towels that I'm gonna reclaim these fabrics and turn them into something else. So it's really awesome using salvage materials because we're able to make fabric last longer instead of buying it new. Also, microfiber like this, it can get kind of expensive to buy. So if you can find an old dish towel or something made out of this microfiber material, and it is petroleum based, so it's not a natural fiber, that's gonna be a lot cheaper. And I love using what I already have to make new stuff. Over here, I have just 100% cotton towel, so this would be more in terms of terry cloth. we have our fabric in the shape that we need. So we just have a really long rectangle. So you're gonna pick one end and you're going to fold and finger press down a half an inch hem. That is ready. It's not gonna keep it down a lot of the time on thicker fabric, but the fabric will kind of remember this crease and we will need this in a minute. So fold this down and flip this over so the fold is facing the table.
Hey everyone, this is Seth. I'm a mentor at Studio NPL, and I'm currently working on a series of videos about how to record and publish your own podcast at home using free tools and things you probably already have in your house. The first video I made in the series was about different types of microphones, recording techniques, and editing software you can use, but it's a little difficult to record a podcast all by yourself. So in this video, I'll be talking about ways that you can record a podcast with friends even though everybody's practicing social distancing right now. The best way to do this is probably ways you're already using it to talk to your friends right now, whether it's phone calls or video chats with things like Google Hangouts, Zoom, and Skype. Uh, the only problem is that you have to find a way to be able to record this audio and so that you can edit it and publish it for other people to hear. The best way to get the recordings of each speaker on your podcast is to have each of them record their own audio at home and then send that all to whoever is going to be editing the podcast. Though it gives you the best quality, it's also the most complex though because it requires everybody to not only have the equipment to record at home but to be pretty uh, knowledgeable on how to use that and everything. Um, and also it just it makes it more complex because you have to record while you do your video call as well so there's just more steps to it uh, and it also opens up kind of more doors for technical difficulties or you know maybe somebody didn't press record or somebody recorded with the wrong microphone but it'll give you the best results because it allows your editor to use the noise effect tool I showed you in audacity last time if you choose to go this way where everyone records independently then once you finish your recording and everything you can export it as an mp3 file a wave file uh, however you want to do it uh, and you can send it to your editor using cloud storage like Google Drive or Dropbox or even transfer services like WeTransfer. Though this is the way used by a lot of podcasters and will give you the most reliable audio quality, it also opens up the doors for a lot of technical difficulties and it just makes it more complex. So there are a couple other ways that simplify this a little bit. So to simplify this, you can use a couple different tools to make it where only one person has to record everything instead of everybody having to be recording their own audio. Uh, video chat services like Zoom usually give you an opportunity to record your calls. Zoom will do this, and Zoom's a great video chat service. It actually, whenever you record them, gives you an audio file for each of your individual speakers, which is very nice for editing and being able to, you know, edit out things or maybe clarify each of the speakers' microphone feed. But one technique Zoom uses to actually make their video calls more seamless and have less lag is that they compress their audio quality so you wouldn't be getting the same as everybody recording their own microphones at home. Another tool you can use is Google Voice. Google Voice is a telephone number service that Google makes where through your own Google account you can make a telephone number and use it like a regular telephone. And there are actually settings to record all of your incoming calls coming to that Google Voice number. The only issue is that it does give it that telephone texture and compresses it like an actual telephone. One solution I did find when researching for this video is a professional podcasting tool called Zencaster, which actually allows everybody to record over the internet and apparently records studio quality without any kind of digital compression of video chats or phone calls. Normally this is a paid service with pretty strict limitations on their free accounts, but while everyone's practicing social distancing, they've actually lowered a lot of the limits on their free accounts. You can have unlimited guests and unlimited recording time per month, and it will record a local audio file for each of those people and send it to whoever's editing the podcast. So this is a free tool that I'd recommend checking out. So I've talked a little bit about some pros and cons of different ways of recording podcasts with friends during social distancing, but I want to talk about one more tip that applies to both methods of recording, and that tip is to use headphones whenever you record. Using headphones is pretty important because it allows each speaker's audio to be isolated and not bleeding over into somebody else's microphone recording, so it makes it more pleasant to listen to and a lot easier to edit. So, as I said in the last video, if your recording solution records everything onto a single audio track, there's not a whole lot of editing you can do outside of what I showed you last time using noise cancellation and basic cutting out different parts and kind of stitching things together if there's an um or a big long silence or anything like that that you want to cut out. But if you record things using multiple audio tracks, there's a little bit more editing you can do and I have Audacity pulled up right here to show you some of that. This file that I've pulled up right here is actually, these are two of me just recording for a sample recording. As you can see, I left some time here at the beginning of each audio track for the editor to go in and cancel out the room noise using that noise cancellation feature I showed last time. But another thing that I have that is a really great tip if you're recording multiple audio tracks is this section right here. What this is, is a trick that some people use to synchronize their audio files. So each of these dots is actually supposed to be somebody saying a number. So this method is each speaker, they are counting to five together and bouncing back and forth with each number. So speaker one says one, speaker two says two, then three, four, 
and 5. The only problem is that they're not in sync right now because they started recording at different times, but this allows your editor to go in and time them up so it should sound like a natural conversation. So use the time shift tool up here and you just drag it so that what is supposed to be the first speaker saying the number 3 falls right in between speaker 2 saying 2 and 4 right there. So that's one way to, to retime everything. So now that these clips are synchronized like that, I'll show you one more edit in addition to all the other ones I showed you in the last video, and this is ways of retiming different audio tracks whenever you have multiple speakers. So with Audacity, obviously you can kind of use the selection tool to grab things and delete them, but that just drags things backward in time instead of letting you drag them and move them independently. So I'm gonna undo that. And a way that you can make speaker one and speaker two not talk over each other right here is that you can actually split this clip and then drag this further down. Now, this error in this one is just made because I recorded both of these sample recordings and it's not actually a conversation with another person. I just made it for this demonstration, but things like that happen with, if you're using a digital calling service, sometimes there'll be lag that comes in there that gets in the way or just naturally talking over each other. So one thing you can do is that you can retime it by using the split tool in Audacity. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click a part right here where I wanna split it so that I can make everything on the other side of that line a new clip and I can drag this down to retime it. So this tool is under the edit menu. It's gonna be under clip boundaries and it's called split. Right here you see the shortcut to do it if you're you know, gonna be using this a lot is command I on Mac. On PC that's gonna be control I. So just click that and you see a thick black line right there, and that indicates that you can actually move the second part of that clip using the time shift tool up here, just like earlier. Just move that. So that's a more intense edit for editing together multiple podcast files if you record independently like that, but it helps your podcast sound a little bit more natural in the conversation, even though you're using some tools that sometimes make conversations a little awkward. That's about it for this video. I'll have a list pop up at the very end of all the different tools that I used and mentioned during this so that you can go and research them on your own and find which one fits you best. The next video I make in this series will be about how to publish your podcast so that you can share it with all your friends. Thanks for watching.
Okay, welcome to the GarageBand workshop here. I'm going to open up GarageBand, and usually when it opens up, you just want to give it a name. Save it as some new name so you know what to call it. I'm going to save it as, I'm going to call this Drum Jam. We're just going to create a simple drum beat that you could add guitar to later or make it into a full song. Uh, first of all, we're going to change the piano to a drum kit and we'll use the one called Smash. And it's just got some good sounds. So, open up and I'm just going to click the pads and see what is where. Figure out where all the sounds are. And, yeah, there's everything in there out with a kick snare and hat and stick and all that first thing we're going to do is change the beats per minute from 120 which is always you know standard to 100 just to kind of make it groove a little slower a little easier to follow and it can it gives you a little count off and a click track but it's kind of hard to follow so i'm going to go ahead and record my own click track it's easier to follow and it's just super easy to listen to instead of the little blips that they give you in GarageBand. So I'll just record a measure or so, a couple of measures, and then um, listen back. But if you double-click that region, it opens it up down here. You hit Apple A, and that's like all, and quantize this to 16th notes. So what we just did, our little click track, so it's going to make it perfect going to be perfect uh, eight notes with a little click in there just easier to follow has more subdivisions and then create a new track that's a duplicate track of that one so it's the same drum kit then I'm just going to slide this over to the very beginning so the click starts at the very beginning and then click on this track down here once again figure out where all the things are that's probably what I'm going to do is kick snare hat for now. So I'm going to turn that down just a little bit. Beginning, and then I'm going to record listening to the click track. You don't have to be 100% perfect, but you just need to be kind of close to it. And you can undo and do as many times as you want so you feel like it's close. So I'll just stop right about somewhere in there. And then double click it and it will open it up and do it again. It'll open it up down here in the bottom and you hit Apple A which selects all the notes that you just did. Again down 16th notes and then it sort of magically lines everything up perfect for you. Sometimes you want that on just a basic rhythm and sometimes you want it to be live sounding. You want a real, something that sounds real, which we'll do in a minute. So we're going to create another track of mm, percussion. But if you notice here, there's drums, cymbals, things like that, but there's no real percussion. So I'm going to go to a different thing on here, percussion. And then we're going to use Latin, Latin percussion. Now we're going to check out the pads. Now we've got some bongos timbales and things. We're just going to create a bongo track to go with that. And this pad could easily be a keyboard, just a USB keyboard would do the same thing. You just have to figure out where the sounds are. So you double click it and goes down in there. And then you hit Apple A. It selects all the notes. Then you hit quantize to 16th notes. It's always 16th notes is always a good place to start. And that lined everything up. Perfect. So that turned out pretty good. So we're going to create another track. 
duplicate settings on percussion as well, but this time we're going to do timbales, just, and we're going to do these live, because we're going to play them kind of fast. We're going to have too much going on for it to quantize, and we want it to make it sound more of like a live recording. So... tried to quantize this track it would be too square sounding and it wouldn't have the little fast notes in there so if we go back and listen to it it just sounds more like a live like a live percussionist a little bit more So yeah, this could have been used as a YouTube video, or it could be a backing track for a song. And of course, you can always plug a microphone into GarageBand and record guitar or vocals or anything you want. And that's just the very basics of GarageBand. Hi, I'm Rebecca Stone, your studio NPL photography and film production mentor. And today, we're going to talk about lighting tips to help make your films a little more professional. One technique that you want to consider is to use natural lighting. Now, when I say natural light, that means using light from a window or maybe filming outside. When using natural light, if you are using a window for your source of light, one thing to consider is where your actors are standing. You don't want to shoot with them directly in front of the window because it could show a silhouette of your actor, unless you have another lighting source, which then you could light your actor's face. Um, if you don't have that lighting source, just move them off to the side, use the light from the window without them standing directly in front of the window. Another thing to think about when you are shooting using natural lighting is to make sure your camera is set for daylight balanced light. Okay, so another tip is using indoor lighting. Now, on some professional movie sets, you might see a movie light like the one I have next to me. You might not have access to that, so you could use a lamp. Something to think about when using a lamp, maybe take the shade off if there's a shade covering the bulb to make the light more bright for you. But at this point, you might have to bounce or diffuse the light. What that does is make it a little bit more even so you just don't have this bright light on your actor unless that's a certain mood you're kind of going for. So if you're wanting to diffuse or bounce light, here are a couple tips on doing that. One is to have the light directed towards something white, like a ceiling or a wall, and then that light will bounce back on your actor, which is what I'm doing right here. So you can kind of see how that's done. Another example would be to diffuse the light. Now on a professional movie set, you'll see diffusion paper, which will cover the light. You could use a sheet or a pillowcase or a white towel, just a nice diffusion uh, product that would help make that light softer so it's not so bright on your actors. All right, so when you're using a diffuser of some sort, whether it's that pillowcase or the sheet or, or diffuser paper, something you need to think about is to do it in a safe manner. You do not want to lay some sort of cloth or paper on top of a hot lamp or a hot bulb because you do not want anything to catch fire. So be aware of where you're placing it, uh, is it touching the bulb? Is it touching something hot? So you want to always make sure you're doing that in a safe manner. So our final tip today on some lighting techniques on making your films look more professional is when you are using any of these lighting techniques to be aware of your shadows. Thinking about your mood, your energy, what are you trying to get across to your audience is going to make a difference on where the shadows are on your actors. If they have some dark shadows under their eyes, under their chin, on their face, if your lighting is coming up from underneath the actors, that could cause a certain energy or mood. Um, is the lighting coming from above to the side? I mean, you really want to kind of pay attention to where those shadows are falling. Is the shadow of the actor falling on the wall behind them? Um, is the shadows of your crew falling around them? So just always be aware of your lighting shadows that are happening due to where your lighting is placed. So you might have to change your lighting to um, help make those shadows work for you or to remove them entirely. 
So the next time you are sitting at home watching your movies, which if you're like me, pretty much every night is movie night right now, um, pay attention to how they are lighting the scenes. Think about it when you're watching your movie, where is that light coming from? Above, below, sideways. Is it a real soft diffused light? Is it a direct light? Is it a natural light? Is it an indoor light? Just kind of pay attention the next time you're watching your favorite movie and you might see how that director or the lighting cinematographer chose to light that scene. And I'll give you some tips to try it on your next movie. Okay, I hope this helped you make your film a little bit more professional. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email, studionplnashville at gmail.com.